Good evening, good evening, good evening, friends, family, Facebook fam, brothers and sisters, saints of God. Thank God for each and every one of you coming to the flow evening of the spoken word tonight. And I will just wait for some few people to come in. Wait for a few people to come in. Um, but good evening to you in Happy New Year. It's a brand new year. We thank God that we made it. 2018 wasn't easy for a lot of us, but we made it through, and it's a brand new year. We're going to start afresh. we we'll start anew, but we thank God um, that this is a day that the Lord has made, and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Hello, hello Cheska. How you doing? Um, happy New Year to you. Glad you could make it. God bless you, and uh, got a few people on. But uh, once again, like I said, good evening. Good evening. And uh, Arnold Daphne Bullock, God bless you guys. How y'all doing? Um, we thank God for each and every one of you being with us on tonight. And um, and we're actually going to start out with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for being in this place. Thank you for being a part of us. And hold on. Got to be presentable. Thank you for being a part of us, Lord God. Thank you for being in our lives, Lord God, for helping us to move and live and have our being, Lord God. We just thank you, Lord God, for being, you know, with, with, within in our presence, Lord God. You said we're two or three together, together, my name, there will I be in the midst, Lord God. But whether we're together, Lord, in person, one-on-one, -on -one, we've seen each other eye to eye, or even on social media, Lord God, you're here. And you're, you're, you're available, Lord God. We thank you for your availability, Lord. Lord, we, we just know that you're able, Lord God, Lord, to do, and, and to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you, we can ask or think, Lord. We thank you for being in our lives and moving in our lives, Lord God, and turning things around in our lives, Lord God. We thank you for a brand new year, for Lord, for, for, for just, for just a reset, for having a reset button. Lord God, in our lives, we just bless you, Lord God, for for your life, your health, and your strength, and your grace and mercy and favor. You, we th help. We thank you, Lord God, for helping us to make it through the day, because the day, Lord God, we could have made it without you, Lord. It, it was stressful for a lot of us, Lord God, but you helped us to make it through the stress. We 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 pressed through the pressure, Lord God, to overcome the stressors, Lord, and we just thank you, Lord God, for being there. We thank you, Lord God, for. You being on the inside, and we thank you, Lord, for your saving grace, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord God, we ask you, Lord God, to bless those who are hearing on tonight, Lord God. Lord, he that hath the ear, let them hear what the Spirit says into the church, the churches, Lord God, and let us all be partakers of this word on tonight, Lord God. Whether saved or unsaved, Lord God, whether church or unchurched, Lord God, let this permeate every heart, Lord God, so that a change can be made. We thank you and bless you. These blessings we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. All right, uh, Ronnie McCoy, God bless you. My cousin Adrian, and uh, praise the Lord, my friend. Yes, um, so tonight we're going to talk about leadership. And um, leadership is very much needed, you know, within the body of Christ because, you know, throughout the Bible, from the beginning to the book of Revelations, there's always been, God had chosen people to do a work. And through this choosing, you know, the, the, there had to be training, you know, there had to be um, an initiate. I would say initiation process, but 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 God had to to break them down, deprogram them, reprogram them, get to them to understand, you know, that it's not about them when it comes to leadership and leading people. You know, it's it's all about others, and it's all about God. You know, so so we're going to talk about leadership, and we're going to talk about leadership in in, in the church, and we're going to talk about leadership, you know, within our jobs and and in the community and and uh, businesses. We're going to talk about just leadership, biblical leadership, you know, biblical models in leadership. So so we can get started, all right? And um, so you know, just want to kind of go back and tell a little story about where leadership took place in my life, you know, and what I witnessed, you know, as far as leadership is concerned. And, you know, ever since I was a kid, I wanted to emulate my father, you know, the things that he did, the, the you know, 
uh, I wanted to do and the things he accomplished that I wanted to accomplish. And he was a positive role model in my life. And he taught me life, how to be a man, how to be a leader and how to survive. You know, my dad did a lot of these things. This is what I witnessed. You know, um, I even sat with him in the trucks, you know, when, when he made his oil deliveries at Barron Oil Company. You know, his father, when his father died, he passed the um, the uh, the business over to him. And basically it was an oil de- delivery company where they delivered oil to homes so the homes could be heated. You know, um, so and, and that that's that's what he did. He had two trucks and, you know, he and his two brothers. And so um, I sat with him in, in the trucks. One truck was a bumpy truck. I enjoyed the bumpy truck. I was about five years old, you know, going to East Place. That truck was just bumpy. And then, um, the other truck was smooth. But each time I watched him, you know, I, I, I sat with him in the office when he made his phone calls and sat with him when he did his paperwork. And I was listening to the eight track tapes that he had in the office. At the, I remember one eight track tape was the spinners. And I kept playing the spinners and eight track tapes. With me. Those who don't know what eight track is, is like CDs are today. You can choose which track you want. And so I would listen to the spinners, you know, and and, and hear, hear him, him do, um, sing their songs on the eight track. And I think there were other songs or whatever, other um, um, tapes or what have you. But this is what I did. I witnessed my father doing these things. And, you know, I even watched him when he set schedules for the employees at Barron Maid Service. And mind you, um, Barron Oil Company was back in 1975. He took over 74, 75. All right. Um, right after my, my, my grandfather, grandmother died. It was a 74. He took it over. OK, so Baron Maid Service, Baron Maid and Generatory Service was when we were in in uh, Albany, Georgia. That was in the, in the early 80s. So I watched him when, when he uh, set schedules for the employees at Baron Maid and Janitorial Service. I even watched when he had to step in to clean the floors at Ecker Drug and, and, and some of the other places um, when one of the employees didn't show up. You know, so he was taking ownership of his company. You know, he he wanted to make sure this company didn't go down. So, you know, I watched him. I I, I, I watched the leadership in him. I watched how the people respected him, the, the work for him. And then I remember watching dad when he did the layout for the articles and ads for South Southeast Georgia Observer, the first black newspaper in that area, in the Coffee County area at the time, back in the late 80s. And my dad and mom's, there was my dad and mom's pr- premier African-American newspaper in Coffee County. And, um, and, and that was in Georgia. And and the surrounding areas. And I was even appointed as the entertainment editor at one point of the newspaper during my freshman year in college. So I remember doing an article about um, De La Soul, first album, Three Feet High and Rising. And people don't get mad at me, but I did a bad review on it. <laughs> They also three feet high and rising. It wasn't that good, but I really like that. Like the uh, CD when when it, you know after after it grew on me, what have you. But yeah, I was an entertainment editor, so I witnessed these things, you know, and um, I learned at, a, at an early age how to be a leader by watching and observing and even partaking in my father's businesses. So sometimes when it comes to leadership, it's an error, you know. People in, inherit, you know. Um, those qualities as being a leader. Because remind you, my father told me, he, my father has been telling me stories since I've been in, um, in Tampa, Florida. But one thing that stood out was my grandfather. Grandfather was born in 1908. Okay. He was born in 1908. Think about it. He was, he owned a dry cleaners. He owned an oil company. He, he owned so many businesses during the 20s. You know, and during the 20s, he even worked for a company, um, worked for a company making $13 an hour in the 20s during the Great Depression, the end of the end of the, um, um, uh, the, 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 the late 20s. Great Depression, man. And then owning businesses as a, as a black man, African-American man during that time where it was, it, it, it was scarce. You couldn't find anything like that in the South, in North Carolina, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. So it's been passed down through generations, leadership. In my family, you know, and um, some people know people are born to be leaders and, you know, they have that trait, you know, others have the desire, you know, and, and it's not a natural thing to them, but they have a desire and, you know, they can be trained and they can learn how to be leaders, you know, and, and but, uh, you know, they may not have necessarily have that natural ability. Now, now, mind you, 
even coming up after college, you know, um, being a part of the ministry, you know, that, that, that I'm a part of under Apostle Johnny Bennett, you know, we all started, you know, together as students, you know, and when the, when the ministry started, but the man of God learned, 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 and he, he, you know, he gathered so much information and, you know, he, he, he ran and studied and he was a natural born leader. He, he actually trained us in leadership as well. You know, it's my father in the gospel. He, he trained us in leadership. So, so even in, in, in the, um, on the biblical aspect of leadership, we learn, you know, even taking it out into the, um, the secular world, you know, to learn how to be leaders, you know, as Christians. It was a lot. My wife, she learned leadership. We, we've been leaders for years, what well, decades now in the community and on our, on our jobs and, and, um, you know, amongst, amongst people. I mean, in, 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 uh, in the church. We have experienced leadership and we've learned we've learned the ups in leadership and the downs in leadership. We've we've succeeded in leadership and we failed in leadership. But all in all, we've learned through these times and these things in leadership. And so um, either way, all leaders need training and or knowledge as to what it takes to be an effective leader. All right. So as as. A church staff, uh, and I, I just want to say this. When we moved here to Tampa, Florida, all right, now mind you, I'm a pastor. You know, Marcy's been in leadership for a long time. You know, it's a missionary, field missionary. And when we came to Tampa, you know, we know what the we knew what our calling was, you know, to start a ministry. But when we came, we humbled ourselves. We came and, 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 uh, and, and became a part of a church, you know, to have a covering over us. And while we were at that church, you know, we didn't tell folks, you know, you know, I, I mean, I mean, I'm a pastor, you know, I say, yeah, I'm a missionary, you know, I've done work, so you know, we're working in the community here, I've done events here, I've done this, you know, fed the homeless, da 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 da, da give 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 our whole resume. We didn't do that. People didn't know what we did. We just came and took and became a partake of the word and sat there and listened heard the word, but guess what? People saw the leadership in us. They saw the discipline in, in ministry in us. Mind you, when we came, we sat behind where the pastor sits, which we didn't know. And then people started seeing and hearing and then just observing us and asked us to, to be partakers in their leadership and some of their groups and so on and so forth. So, we be, became partakers in leadership in the church that we're associated with right now. And, and, and it's just God. We didn't go out there boasting, saying who we are, saying what we've done over the past few decades. People can see leadership in you. People can notice leadership in you. And, 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 and if it's been instilled in you and if you've learned and trained in that leadership, people will see that and people will elevate you in that. So even as a church staff or a volunteer ministry leader, you know, or even out there in your job or if you own a business in the community, you can learn valuable and unique lessons from several biblical characters. You know, you know, here there are seven whose leadership played a significant role in leading the early church and furthering the gospel. All right. So let's start with Paul. OK. Find, let's find out who Paul was first and foremost. You know, Paul was a man, you know, who whose plight was to kill the Christians because they were going against, you know, what he was taught and what he learned. You know, th this Jesus was not this Messiah that he learned, you know, from 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 the uh, the, the, the the law in the Old Testament. You know, from the scriptures. You know, so he's like, wait a minute, did this. Jesus isn't what, you know, I, I perceive to be, you know, what, what's been prophesied as a Messiah. So these Christians are off. And so, you know, they're, 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 they're messing up, you know, what, you know, what God's um, purpose is in our lives as Jews. And so we have to destroy them. We have to kill them. And that was his plight to kill Christians, you know. But, um, but you know, Paul was walking down. It was, was on the road to um, Damascus and, and God knocked him off his horse. Huge light. Blinded him, you know, and and uh, 
And he's like, you know, he looked up and he said, who, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus, the one you persecute. And, and so, you know, um, the book of Acts 13, 14, uh, 13 and 47 says, I've appointed you as a light for the Gentiles to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. That was his purpose. God called him because the other disciples were so engrafted into their culture that they didn't see past their culture. You know, as far as looking at the Gentiles, what Jesus told them, you know, that, that, that he came to save the world, not just the Jews. You know, and then, um, and Paul thought of himself as nothing in the total scheme of things. So he's, you know, he basically, you know, diminished himself as, you know, saying that it's more about him, all about him, and there's nothing about me. I'm just a vessel, and I'm here to make sure people hear this gospel. I'm here to make sure people outside of the Jews, outside of Israel, hear this gospel. So, Lord, however you use me, please use me however you see fit. And he was thoroughly subservient to the will of God. You know, he, he, he abased himself. He knew who he was prior to him getting converted. He knew who he was. And mind you, when uh, when, when, when God God sent him, he, he had to send him to be trained. You know, um, to Ananias. It was a time when he was blinded. He had to, you know, be healed from his blindness from when, when God blinded him. And, and you know, and it was as a, a redirection of his thought process, of his mental capacity. And, and this man had to train him, had to teach him the Holy Scriptures on, you know, on, on the Word of God and the history and what his purpose is. And that's what he did. And he instilled, instilled in Paul the Word of God. And so he was committed to a specific and meaningful mission. So, so basically with Paul, he believed in something bigger than himself. All right. And, and, and then Paul had to encourage, um, had the curse in the face of opposition because he had limitless, limitless horizons in his mission. So basically, when Paul saw the work that he had to do, the world was his oyster. Which way do I need to go now? Lord, direct me because now I'm about to do your work. You know, it's not about me anymore. I, w I was a big wig. You know, prior to you coming into my life. But now, Lord, I humble myself. It's not about me. It's about it's about the work. It's about the big picture. It's about the people. It's about their souls. He believed in something bigger than himself. That's how he became a leader. People followed him because he believed in something bigger than himself. He abased himself. When you see leaders that are humble, that realize it's not about them, it's about the bigger picture and trying to progress others, then you know that's a real leader. A leader that claims himself, I'm the big dog, I'm the top dog, I'm the boss. You know, you have to follow me, you have to listen to me, you have to know, because if you if you don't get it right, I'm going to fire you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demote you. You know, you, that's not a real leader. They're, because they're exalting themselves above you. Leader, A leader leads. OK, and he believed himself. He believed in himself, but he believed in something bigger than himself, namely Jesus Christ and him crucified. So in leadership, you have to have the confidence, of course. Yes. You have to have the confidence to know that you can lead. Yes. But that confidence should not be a cocky confidence to think, you know, that, 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 that it's all about you. Headiness, high mindedness. And I got my nose up in the air because this is who I am. I'm the boss. I'm a boss and you can't touch this boss. I'm untouchable. No. His whole plight, the whole plight of, 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 of a leader is to know that you're humble, but also know that you have the qualities But you, because you can't step into leadership unless you have been trained how to be a leader and to walk as a leader. Even if you have those in, in, inherent qualities in you and, and, and it's natural, you still need training. 
you know, so you can effectively lead. Because, you know, there are people that are natural, natural leaders and, and they lead and, and they do a great job. But there's some things they can even even go, you know, further in the leadership and leading people by learning. Give yourself to reading. Go through training. So Paul did. He humbled himself. He believed in something big, bigger than himself. Let's talk about Nehemiah. Number two, build on what God has given you. God is, so God has given you tools, all right? You have the tools there before you, all right? And then he's told you what to do with the tools, and he's instructed you on how to use the tools. So now put it to work. Put it into action. Build on what you've been given with those tools. If you've been, if you've been given tools on going out to start a business, you've gone out there, you've done seminars, you've done trainings, you know, you, you've, 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 worked, you, you've, um, you've learned, you've read books, you know, um, and, and, and you've had one-on-ones with people and, you know, you sat with people and watched them and, and, and you've been given those tools. Fear can destroy many things in your life, which is the main thing is progression. You cannot progress when there's fear in your life. You cannot progress when, when somebody talks down on the tools that's been given to you, talk, no, talks down on your ability to use those tools that's been given to you, saying you're not this, you're not that, you know, you're not the other, you know, you, you're not who you say that you are. You know, you, you got to overlook that stuff and keep going and say, look, I'm going to build anyhow. So Nehemiah's leadership was built not so much on ancestry from the Jewish lineage as by faithfulness. He, he, he would build the walls of, on faith, okay? He was uh, obscure in, in comparison to other great Old Testament heroes, but faithfulness separated him from mediocrity. He was willing to build that wall. We're not talking about Trump. I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> Nehemiah was willing to build that wall. And he wasn't mediocre about it. He had purpose. He was focused. He knew what he had. If you have tools, if you have what God has given you in your mindset and you think it's not enough, but God says it's enough, ask God for wisdom. Ask God for knowledge and how to use these things to build, to forward the progression of leadership to lead other people to show, you know, that, 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 you know, there is greater. God has greater. Nehemiah did that. God has given each leader specific gifts. Some are not as, as visible and all are useful. So the gifts that you have, utilize the gifts, utilize the tools that God has given you. Don't let it lie dormant. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. You walk in that sound mind. You walk in love. The power is going to go forth. Mind you, faith activates. Take that back. The anointing is activated when you work. You put your hands to work. Utilize the gifts that's within you to work, to build on what God has given you. So when people follow, and and, and, and and that's that influence thing I talked about a while back. You know, you're building influence. And when people see that, they will follow. You know, they, 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 they will, will understand influence and, okay, I can learn from this person. But through the humility of what's been given to you while you're building, you know, in, in, in this thing that God has given you, these gifts that God has given you, people will see the humility and, and don't mind following. All right, let's talk about Joshua. Bring the people, bring the best people to the table. All right. So Joshua had been in the presence of God. And a theophany, what a theophany is, 
is the many appearances of God. God has appeared as angels, you know, so many times. It's a the theophany. That's a theological term. A theophany, a theophany had taken place in Joshua. Joshua 5.15. The commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, remove the sandals from your feet. Second time. I'm thinking the man of God, Apostle Bennett, my apostle, he, he, he mentioned that uh, during New Year's Eve, he, he, um, how he was talking about the, 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 the feet, you know, that, 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 uh, that are utilized for the gospel. And in, in many cases, like Moses on the, on the mount, he asked Moses to, to unlatch his shoes and remove his shoes in the presence of the Lord. He said, remove the sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So bring the, bring the best people to the table. Because of this special blessing, he was appointed as one with the judicial powers and responsibilities in Joshua 14, 6 and 15. He had a special place. He was courageous. And as indicated by the spy scenario in Numbers 13 and 31, he was most likely the envy of other young leaders. But Moses brought him to the table of leadership because he was the best person for the job. So my guess is that he had the skills, the, the, the like of which Moses himself admired, perhaps envy. Joshua was gonna be was, was the one that's gonna lead them over to Canaan. Moses could not cross over anymore because Moses did too many, had made too many mistakes. But he brought the best, best people to the table. If you are in leadership, through wisdom, by leading, you can't do it by yourself. This is not a Lone Ranger type situation. In leadership, you have to have a team. And in order to do that, you have to have the best people at your table. All right. You got to bring the best people at, to your table. Ask God who to direct you to, to bring them to the table, to grow and to build, you know, in, in, when it comes to leadership. You know, because when a person sees a Lone Ranger, that could be dangerous. We see that in the White House. It's basically a Lone Ranger. You know, those who disagree with me, just disagree. It, it is what it is. He wants to do things himself with his own mind, own judgment, own thoughts. And mind you, the big majority of the people aren't following him. He has a small following. Okay, not going to kill the ones who follow him. Not going to, uh, you know, I, I, not, not going to exhort the ones who, who who don't. But all in all, this whole thing is 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 is, is a um is in regards to Christ being our head of the government. You know, so we're not we're we're we're, we're not in this thing by ourselves. We have to have a team. We have to bring the best people to the table so that we can can vibe off of one another, and and learn off of one another. You know, I you know I I, I need you know I, I I need your feedback. You know, this is my vision for you know what's about to take place. You know, so this is where I see where we're going. Okay, but my team, I need your feedback on how we should go about doing this. All right. Because just my 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 own thought process in doing this, it won't it won't get me there by myself. Because I may make you know a wrong decision, but get, bringing the best people around you in the round table, like somebody's going, the, the the team together will take you to the promised land. You can't do it by yourself, and then think about it: people are going to have differing opinions. You know, different thoughts. Okay, now when you're bringing that team together and every, and then you're starting to have people, you know, bring bring forth, you know, different differing opinions. Then now you as a leader need to step up and try to bridge the gap of the differing opinions. Barnabas, you know, who, who was a uh, who walked with Paul, you know, in, in partnership in ministry. He was nick nicknamed the son of encouragement. Acts 4 and 36. He bridged the gaps between the Greek and the Jewish worlds. Born, um, born a Capriot and reared a Levite, he linked the Hellenistic world and the Jerusalem church 
And even when John Mark was being severely ostracized by Paul, Barnabas stood by John Mark. He was generous, and that in itself bridges the gaps of selfish and greedy people. If God's grace is given the opportunity to be operative, he sold his land and gave it to the church treasury. He was not an out front kind of person, but rather stayed in the background as a fan and supporter of Paul. The most memorable aspect of effective leadership of a pastor is when he has survived the polarities of differing opinions and modeled having each side respect the others. So we need to have respect of our, our views. But then the Bible says, come let us reason together, saith the Lord of hosts. So when leadership it's about reasoning, but it's about reasoning correctly through understanding and knowledge and training and what has worked and what will work. And then bridging the gaps of those differing opinions so that we can all be on one accord. The Bible says to be on the same, same mind and the same judgment. All need to think of like... All, on a basic level, we all need to think alike when it comes to, men, to, to, to to leadership and even in ministry. If we have a team, we have to think alike in the same basic level, but then others may have certain God ideas over the other, and then that's where we have to come and reason. So what about this? What about that? What about the other? You ask God for, for, for insight, hindsight, foresight, you ask God for, for, for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding so that the correct decision can be made when bridging those gaps of differing opinions. All right, that's what Barnabas, uh, that was number four. So Barnabas did. Then we're looking at uh, Moses. Blind your eyes to petty criticism. Moses was seen as the patient leader of a people with little faith. Exodus 16 and 18. I'm sorry, 16 and 8. And then 16, um, and then verses 16 through 20. His church was a murmuring people because his church was lacking understanding. Church had been in bondage under Egypt for, for many years. And so here it is. They, 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 they're in their exodus and now they're following this man. This man does not think on the same level as those that they were under, um, under bondage with. And so, so now they're like, they remember complaining. They had this life of luxury. You know, in Egypt, you know, they 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 get fed three times a day and you know had clothes and the whole nine, but here it is now they're in the wilderness. And now they're 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 at a point of um, you know, that they're, they're murmuring, they're complaining, they have issues, you know, you know, they they're not getting fed on a, on a um, you know, like they were getting fed back when they were in Egypt, you know, they're getting fed quail and, and, and manna from heaven and you know, um sometimes the shoes will get messed up, but God always provided. Every time God provided, they still murmur. So so they comp they complain and whine at every inconvenience. And look, and that's Exodus fifteen and twenty four and, and and sixteen two two through three. He he did get disgusted. As a leader, you're going to get disgusted at times. How do you handle it? Remember, he struck the rock. He got angry. He struck the rock and disobeyed God. God God said, "Speak to the rock." He said, don't, 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 don't hit the rock. Don't strike the rock. Speak to the rock. He got so mad, he like, bam. So he looked at some water. Look, I'm tired of these jokers. Get my nerves. How many people have been, been in that situation where people just get on your nerves so bad you just you have to internalize the anger? Because <laughs> people going to be people. People are going to be people. You just have to say, Lord, give me patience. And turn, help me to turn a blind eye to petty criticism. People gonna people gonna criticize you no matter what. For every little thing you do, people are gonna criticize you. For if you do the smallest thing, for and you do the largest thing, you or you don't do anything at all, people are gonna criticize you. They're gonna say something. But sometimes you have to turn a blind eye to petty criticism. And that's what I've had to do, even in the recent past. 
turn a blind eye to petty criticism. Some criticisms are petty. They can be ugly. Turn a blind eye and just keep on moving. So he got disgusted. He struck the rock and disobeyed God, but his patience had worn thin. He, Moses had enough. Or these people, you're like, I'm trying to lead you all to the promised land. But because y'all kept complaining and murmuring and murmuring and complaining and complaining and murmuring, 40-day trip lasts, is going to last some freaking 40 years. Because you guys don't see, you don't see where I'm trying to lead you. You've seen so many, so many um, 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 instances where, where God showed up and so many miracles but even with these miracles, you still complain. I'm tired. But Moses still, at certain points, he turned a blind eye to petty criticism. Petty criticism wears on the leader. The, the wise leader will work hard at blinding his or her eyes to the pet pettiness of church members' criticism or workers' criticism or Co-workers and people in your business and the community, you know, basically the, the, the leader will work hard at turning blind eyes and blinding his or her eyes to the pettiness of these people and their criticisms. If that doesn't work, the leader will outlast them. Just about every pastor has struck the rock. Every leader has struck the rock. Instead of speaking to the rock, he struck the rock out of anger because of the daggone people. But some things you have to turn a blind eye. Sometimes things you have to just shut your mouth on. Like Jesus never said a mumbling word with the petty criticism on his walk and his stance on who he was. He turned a blind eye. They say, you know, you claim to be the um, the son of God. That's what you say. I mean, and, and Jesus had to be get to the point where he didn't get angry. So, you know, so just about every leader has struck the rock. Every pastor struck the rock at one time or another. I passed Apostle John Bennett. He's done it quite a few times. He's struck the rock. He's gotten angry because folks don't want to act right. I, me included. I mean, every member is going to get to the point where they just don't act right. But every person, you know, that, that you're leading, you know, whether it's at your job or your business or in the community or what have you, gonna in, in organizations, it's going to get, get to the point where people just don't want to act right. They don't want to follow right. And you're going to get angry. Sometimes you're going to just fly off the handle. But then you got to bring yourself back in. And but then like Moses, the same leader, the same pastor, you know, usually has the resilience to see things through. Nobody said that it would be easy. Nobody. It's not an easy thing. So when you're dealing with the criticisms, just breathe and keep moving. Even Mace the Raptor, breathe. he said, breathe, stretch, shake, let it go. That's the truth. So you just got to shake it off. You know, because people try to, try to criticize to destroy other people, to destroy leaders. You can't let that destroy you in your leadership, in your walk. In your elevation. Number six, you know, you bind the ties of love and courage. Elijah. Today's um to, to today's environment, today's nomenclature calls it tough love. Some call it a tough mind and a tender heart. Elijah had both. He loved God. He had the courage to speak to the evils of this day. Where is your God, he asked. Perhaps he's sleeping and will wake up. <laughs> First Kings 18, 27. 
His sarcasm showed his disdain for those who have forsaken God. In every effective leader's life, there's a time for love, but there's also a time for, cur for courage. It may, be, it may not come quickly. It will, however, come eventually. If the leader becomes a wimp, soft, that leader will lose the leadership role. So a leader needs to have courage. A leader, leader needs to walk in authority, under God's authority, with humility. You know, he'll lose the leadership role. And effective leaders have the courage to speak even when it is unpopular to speak because they speak the truth with love. I know working at my job, you know, um, uh, supervisor will call and say, and, and, and it's not, it's not popular, but sometimes the supervisor has to call somebody in to the office and say, look, the director's on me about you and I need you to step up your game. I, 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 you know, I don't bother you because I see you're doing the work, but some things you're falling short of, I need you to step up your game. He said, I'm not trying to be hard, but I got to be at this point. So you can do, you can be motivated to go forward. That's what a leader has to do. Sometimes it's not popular to tell the truth about some, some people. Some people are scorners. You, sometimes you can't, you know, you, you can't tell the truth about a scorner because they're just going to come back with, with, with more stuff. The Bible says rebuke, not a scorner. Some people you just gotta have to leave alone. But, you know, you have to have the courage to do those things. Courage to speak. You know, speak a truth about something when it's not popular. Pastors do it all the time. And, and, and those pastors you know, who continue to go forward and go forward and go forward, they understand how to speak the truth in love and in grace, but in power. So people would know, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm so sorry. People would know that, look, if you don't go by, you know, the written rules, then there are consequences. And I can't just let you just fall by the wayside because your feelings are going to be hurt. I'm trying to, sometimes it has to be a warning. Sometimes it has to be, you know, a, a, a harsh um, 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 call on something that, you, that they've done. And they got the feelings hurt. They, they, they did it. They, you know, they, and if, but if it's help them to go forward, you've done your job. But it's all about wisdom. It's all about understanding. You know, so again, you have to bind the ties of love and courage. So courage makes you go out into the battlefield and fight. But at the same time, courage brings forth love so that it will sew up the hurt, the, 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 uh, the torn, the rip that the person has, has experienced from the truth that's been presented to that person. Love does that. Love sews you up. Love sews you up when you've been, you, 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 when surgery has been, been uh, performed on you. Love, you have to be skillful, skillful enough to bind the, uh, the, the, the ties of, of courage and love. And last thing, Bounce back after you're knocked down. Woo, Lord, I'm trying to tell you throughout my life and my wife's life, throughout our lives in leadership and doing ventures and, and businesses and things of that nature, you know, we've, we've fallen. We, we've, we've hit hard, rock bottom in, in, uh, in businesses or what have you. But there's nothing wrong with falling. There's nothing wrong with making mistakes. If you hear 
the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the speeches of of the successful people in life. You know, you hear from Denzel Washington, and you, you hear it from from um, uh, uh, Will Smith, and they say, you know, how do you become successful? You have to fail. You have to make mistakes. You have to fall. And and like like my apostle was told me, Apostle Johnny Bennett said, you know, although you've fallen, you fell forward. That gives you a chance. You've gained ground. Some people haven't even haven't even made the the attempt to 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 do the work, so they never gained any ground. So, but you did, and you fell, but you fell forward. You gained some yards. So, a leader will bounce back. After you're knocked down, when you're knocked down, don't give up. A real leader will not give up. Real leader will sure. Well, okay, the real leader falls, but they strategize. They write the vision on the tables, make it plain. So those that read it will go forward and make sure it comes to pass. You have to strategize so you don't just jump up and, and, and go forward again. Okay, what what did I just learn when I made when I made this fall? What 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 what, what are my takeaways when I just fell? So what what do I need to do? Who do I need to talk to? Who do I need to see? What training do I need? You know what what what, what is it that that I, I need to um to 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 see before me? I, you know to to uh to visualize and, and you know trying to um you know, assess the situation on what took place on why I fell, you know, what, what made me mess up? What made me fall, you know, assess the situation. And then from that, you know, write down the vision. Okay. This is what I need to do. This is what I did before that didn't work. This is what I need to do. This is going to work. Okay. Now talk to those who've been in this situation before. What did you do? How did you get there? All right. Write a few notes there. Then read your word. And what does the word, what, what does the word say in regards to the situation that you're in, you know, where you fell? And then, then you compile those things together. And then you, you ask the Lord to help you develop a plan that's going to work. And then you get back up and then and do it and then move forward. Peter in Matthew 16, Peter was both a rock and a stumbling block. <laughs> People, Peter did, did some crazy stuff. You know, he was both blessed and disgraced almost in the same breath. It is enough to discourage any pastor or any leader. You know, you are the foundation. You know, you are the devil's advocate. Discouraged by the disapproval of Jesus Yet, yet, yet blessed by the warmth and affection of Jesus. Resilience may be the cornerstone of effective leadership, being able to bounce back. One church member or one person at work, or one person in your business, one person in your organization, one person within the community and in, in leadership, one person compliments your, your, you know, the, the, the work that you've done, or you, if you're a, you're a pastor or you're a leader or, you know, the, the mess, the Sunday morning message, one person, you know, compliments you, you know, the next complains about your quoting, you know, uh, a certain, a certain person because the person is not a Christian or the person just has issue. Hey, Josh, I just saw Jen, um, earlier. It's good to see you, man. Um, God bless you. God bless you. Can't wait to see you in the next, uh, the next home builders. And, and so, so because of the resilience, you know, you have to be able to understand and deal, you know, what, what people are going to do to try to knock you down. It's people going to try to knock you down. People will trip you. People are going to trip you to make sure you fall. If you fall, don't lay there, you know, because you feel that, that person is ridiculing you because they tripped you and they're blasting you out in front of everybody else. Don't just lay there. Get back up and walk. Bounce back with resilience. Somebody may even push you. Somebody may even give you an uppercut. Push you. Knock you in your jaw. Knock you down. Somebody may, may, you may even get knocked down and fall backwards. Does that mean you're done? No. Shake it off. Get back up. And continue to move forward. That's what people want to see. In leadership, because there may be something that stalls you in your move and going forward in leadership. That does not mean 
That does not mean to stay there and stay stagnant and 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 and, look, and you know just get so discouraged that you can't do it anymore. You got to move forward. You have to move forward. You have to bounce back up. You have to turn around, get on your knees, shake it off a little bit. You know, get some water, put some water in your face, and then they say, okay.